Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you. Dr. Travis Brown, what is this medical life all about? This is the pursuit of knowledge as we learn about diseases from the ancient times to the present day. These are the stories of medicine. Dr. Travis Brown, as I reflect back on my life and all the people I've met in different groups, I wish I could distinguish the ones who were going to be a negative influence from the ones who were positive. I don't know if anyone sorted that out at the social level, but our guest today has sorted this out at the cellular level. (laughs) He has. He is a renowned immunologist. So this is uh, Professor Peter Doherty. So he is a Nobel Prize winner. And as with every once in a while, we get a guest who... We, we often lead into these episodes with the, the history and a story about how they have the, the condition came together. And sometimes we have the guest who is the story. <laughs> it, it, they are the, the, a person who has changed our understanding so significantly that it is the, uh, a pivotal moment. And, and Professor Doherty is that person in this instance. And uh, his research in the 1970s uh, was pivotal in immunology, ended up receiving the Nobel Prize in the 90s. And we will be talking to him today about his lead up to that, his uh, prize, and then for the future. I think he's on the line. Let's get underway. Professor Peter Doherty trained initially as a veterinarian before becoming an immunologist and pathologist who, with Rolf Singernagel of Switzerland, received the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine in 1996 for their discovery of how the body's immune system distinguishes virus-infected cells from normal cells. After leading a research laboratory at the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia, and teaching at the University of Pennsylvania, Peter headed the Department of Experimental Pathology at the John Curtin School of Medical Research in Canberra and served as chairman of the Department of Immunology at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, where he still holds the Michael F. Tamer Chair of Biomedical Research. In 2022, he joined the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Melbourne and from 2014 has been at the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity, a joint venture between the University and the Royal Melbourne Hospital. The Nobel Award led to an increasing involvement in public science communication, both in his own area of viral pathogenesis and immunity, and in topics related to environmental sustainability and climate change. He's active on social media and was a prominent commentator through the first two years of COVID-19. He's also written multiple books, and there's a full bibliography in the show notes for this episode. Professor Doherty, welcome. Good to be here. I'd like to take us back to the beginning, please, because before all of the research and the awards, the desire to learn and understand was a significant part of your education. Can you take us through that? How did that come about? I guess I was a curious kid. I was growing up in Queensland, Brisbane, in the era before sunblock, (laughs) and that meant a lot of outdoor activities. I'd get sunburnt fairly quickly, so... In fact, standing out on a cricket pitch was my version of hell. <laughs> and so I probably, I maybe read a bit more and, uh, and read into things a bit more than, than many kids of my age. And I did that from a very early age, but I was encouraged to do that. My, my father was a reader. My mother was a musician, a classical pianist, piano teacher, didn't really like to teach, but loved to play. So I was brought up with classical music and books. And of course... I'm pretty ancient, so that's the pre-television era too. Mm-hmm. Now, just can I, you, you mentioned classical music. Did you take that mantle up? Did you start to play yourself? 
my mother hated to teach, so she started to teach me the ah. piano. And as soon as I did the usual thing of saying, I don't want to do this, she said, fine. <laughs> so I'm not sure whether I've ever quite forgiven her, but, uh, but I do thank her for the growing up with, uh, with great music. Yeah, do you still do you still listen? You you uh, you appreciate your classical music? The music, the the radio has always changed uh, to tune to, to the classical music station. Um, we we haven't been to concerts much since so forth recently. Very keen on opera, but COVID sort of slowed that down. Mm. Now, in your own notes, you actually mention an older cousin, Ralph Doherty, who was a scholar and became a leading viral epidemiologist, and clearly had an impression upon you. But yes, well, Ralph was the star of the Doherty side of the family. I think he topped the um, school leaving exam at age 14 and uh, went to one of the private schools on scholarship and then was uh, had a medical scholarship from the Queensland Department of Health. He's 13 years older than me, so quite a bit older, so we weren't that close in a sense. But back then, the way that state governments got young doctors and dentists and vets go to rural areas was to sign them up and they paid their university uh, costs so far as they existed and uh, gave them a stipend but then you were expected to work for them for the length of the course and that that provided doctors to rural areas. Ralph originally went to uh, Alpha as a as to run the little hospital in a country town and uh, uh, but then they uh, soon brought him back into the laboratory the Queensland Institute of Medical Research sent him to a branch they had in Innisfail, I think, uh, where he worked on leptospirosis uh, in the cane workers because uh, rat transmitted leptospira was a big problem there. And then he went to the Harvard School of Public Health. They sent him across there to get some training in virology and public health. And then he became director of the Queensland Institute of Medical Research, uh, which was then a... Uh, I think a couple of army huts on the Brisbane golf course near the, <laughs> near the hospital and the medical school. And he succeeded Ted Derrick, who discovered Rickettsia burnettii, the Q fever <laughs> organism. And he became involved in what was then the Rockefeller program. There was a big Rockefeller program across the planet to discover the viruses that were in insects. And he became involved in that and funded through them. And they eventually gave up. Rockefeller eventually gave up because they'd discovered so many viruses, couldn't tie them into any disease. But Ralph did tie a mosquito isolate into uh, using a whole bunch of sera that had been collected in the north for pyrexias of unknown origin, the PUOs. He, they isolated this virus and they ran it for neutralisation against the PUO sera. And that was the Ross River virus, which they named. Mm. But uh, the interesting thing is, clearly you admired his progression, but you didn't choose to go into medicine. You went into, into veterinary science. Why well, is that? I had very little exposure to university-educated people. I mean, there was the local doctor, the local dentist, the local vet, and I had very naive perceptions of what people in those professions did. My parents left school at age 15, as many Queenslanders did. Queensland was not the education state. It didn't even have a functioning university yes. until about 1920. The uh, landholders and so forth were afraid that if they started a university, they would encourage young men to be white-gloved esthetes who would not work the land. And <laughs> right up through into the 30s, I think, uh, Queensland doctors went off to Melbourne for their clinical training, at least. They, were, they produced a lot of pharmacists and a lot of dentists, but no doctors until quite late. So my idea of the medical profession was people who sat around in offices and listened to people whine about being sick. And you know, I, at age 16, I hadn't, didn't have much empathy, as most 16-year-old boys of that era uh, didn't have much empathy. And uh, I went to an open day at the vet school, and I thought, oh, that's fascinating. I knew no biology. I'd learned no biology at school. And so I took one of those Queensland government scholarships to study to be a vet. Mm. Now, the interesting part is you also had an interest in philosophy. So a number of uh, famous philosophers you mentioned, I'm, I'm sure you'll probably be much better at saying their names than Steve. Uh, Aldous Huxley, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. 
uh, Ernest Hemingway. So how did this influence your career? I, at all? I basically read anything and everything. And um, at the time I made the decision to go to the vet school, and, and I wasn't reading them in the sense of reading them as philosophers. I was reading them more as novelists and commentators. So at the t- time I was sort of thinking about what I'd do, Outside my school work, I was reading Jean-Paul Sartre, who is a philosopher, of course, Albert Camus, uh, who's kind of a right-wing French novelist, The Plague, uh, for instance, Uh, Huxley, who was part of the Huxley science family. Mm -hmm. I got to know, actually, his half-brother, who won the Nobel Prize for Physiology, and he he was very proud of the fact that the Huxleys were one of the Britain's great atheist families. And so... (laughs) So I was reading Huxley, and I was also reading Hemingway, of course, who's the man of action. So I was a very confused kid. <laughs> well, also, were you really a true Queenslander? So, so far, we've had classical music, we've had medicine and, and tertiary education, and now uh, philosophy. Uh, do you consider yourself a Queenslander? I'm, I'm, I consider myself, in some sense, a failed Australian, in some <laughs> sense of being the bronzed surfboard riding uh, <laughs> Australian who's a completely admirable character and uh, and so forth. But in that sense, I don't think of myself as a failure. But, uh, but as a success, it's interesting. We lived for quite a while in the American South at, working at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, a great, great cancer hospital in the southern United States. And, and it's a similar sort of culture. Mm. It's kind of a redneck element to it. In fact, when I was talking to some of the locals, I could always do the I'm just a redneck like you a bit because the rednecks were basically uh, in the south, were basically Scots-Irish who again had very fair complexions and went to the American south, ran the cotton plantations like Scarlett O'Hara's father and got rednecks because they were sunburned. <laughs> so, but if you look at that culture, that's produced a lot of the leading and most perspective novelists in the United States and poets. There's a great literary culture in the American South and it's a very concealed and, com- and complicated uh, uh, culture um, because of slavery and all these sorts of things. And it was a bit like that in Brisbane too. There was a very active music scene, very active uh, amateur theatre scene and, uh, and art as well. Memphis, which you wouldn't think of as an intellectual city in any sense, had a very good college of art. In fact, uh, Jimmy Carter's daughter went there to study art. So it's this sort of tension where you have these communities or the the state, for instance, which like Texas or Tennessee would seem pretty down market and redneck, where you actually have a vibrant sort of culture in response to that or rubbing against it. But, of course, the fact is that most of those people get out very quickly. So, yes. And they go, in the US, they would go to New York. And, and I need to ask, did you bond with the other rednecks over pumpkin scones? Well, pumpkin scones are never a problem. Uh, <laughs> uh, shoe fly pie, 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 actually. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, right. There's some very sweet pies and, of course, uh, just like everywhere, they uh, they drink a fair bit. So uh, yeah. I've given up on that, actually. I don't drink at all now, which is a very miserable thing. But uh, as one ages, it uh, seems to work better. Yeah. Now, I mentioned uh, with some of your teachers, you, you seem to be inspired by teachers who taught you marine biology, infectious disease, genetics and immunology. Can you tell mm. us either what was it about their teaching or how they taught that inspired you? The vet school and at the University of Queensland closed down during World War II and then started again after the Second World War. And as a consequence of that, it recruited a quite young and interesting faculty from across the planet. And some of the people they recruited were actually pretty first-class researchers, including John Sprent, who was a parasitologist and immunologist. His son, Jonathan Sprant, is also a very famous immunologist, fellow of the Royal Society, but a medical, medically qualified uh, graduate. And they taught some fairly basic science in biology. And also at that stage, the vet school, the problem with vet schools is they tend to be rather small and they don't have the great advantage of the medical schools of having hospitals. That's a great, great feature for medical schools because you get the hospital providing all that training. And vet schools don't have that. It's a very, very big problem with vet schools. 
But the basic science, uh, they didn't teach in the vet school. They taught in the department, in the university departments of science. So we did first year zoology and botany and physics for, um, for the not brightest people and uh, <laughs> that sort of stuff. We learned veterinary anatomy, physiology. We learned in the medical school environment with a wonderful professor who was, uh, who was a great teacher and very renowned at the University of Queensland called Otto Butz Olsen, a hematologist who ran seminars and Everyone loved this guy. He was quite outrageous, a bit sexist at times, but the girls didn't seem to mind. And so it, it was a very good intellectual training. Also, you know, the veterinary schools weren't particularly interested in subjects like ageing at that mm-hmm. stage, particularly this one, because it was in the state of Queensland, which is a big agricultural farm animal production state. And uh, they were, the vet schools were very much about animal production and animal industry rather than medicine. Now vet schools are very different. They're a lot more about medicine, a lot more about uh, animal medicine, but I was never terribly engaged by it. So we got a very good scientific training. We also got a good scientific training in genetics, as it then was, which I think was pretty much an unknown thing in medical schools of that era. And pathology was very well taught. So they taught pathology, infectious disease, uh, those areas very well. I became interested in infectious disease and immunity and virus infections and immunity, partly through reading the book's great Australian scientist, Sir McFarlane Burnett, Mm -hmm. who was a virologist but actually won the Nobel Prize for immunology. Mm -hmm. Now, your studies took you to Edinburgh and you went on a research path, but there was a seminar you attended, which which there was a quote that surprised me when I when I read it, that you stated, it convinced me I had no real understanding of contemporary immunology. And given yes. where you've <laughs> gone, I found that quite striking, because how did you go from feeling like you didn't know anything, and then a few decades later, you end up accepting the Nobel Prize? How, how do I connect those two? Well, we- the story of how we got to Edinburgh is kind of interesting. We, there was a, uh, I was in the Queensland State Laboratory. I'd been working on leptospirosis. I did a bit of time as a field veterinarian, and they brought me back for a research project where they didn't have anyone to run it. So I ran this big research project on bovine leptospirosis. Also, I got some training in virology, but I realised I didn't want to be a diagnostic virologist. There was a job advertised in Nature for a senior veterinary neuropathologist. This is a pretty rare, <laughs> rare fish, as you imagine. And I knew that this place the, in Edinburgh, a sheep disease research place called the Mordun Institute, uh, you could work there and do a PhD. So I wrote off and said, look, I don't know anything about neuropathology. Um, I know a bit of pathology and I'm a young graduate. And if, if you don't get anyone else, <laughs> I'd be interested in doing the job and doing a PhD at Edinburgh University. And uh, they said, come immediately. I was, I got, it was a letter, of course. There was no yep. email, so it took a while to come back. But uh, they had no other applicants. And so I, I was a veterinary neuropathologist, but I was working on a sheep disease called Lauping encephalitis, tick-borne encephalitis virus, you know, a bit like Japanese encephalitis or Murray Valley encephalitis, only, only tick-borne, and the same sort of family. I was studying the pathogenesis of it. So that's been really my field, pathogenesis, how virus infections work and how they kill and how we... So I knew quite a bit about the antibody response. That was fine. In fact, we discovered, and I think the first really good demonstration, that antibody-forming cells localise in the brain of uh, sheep with encephalitis, uh, true in humans too, and they produce antibody locally in the brain tissue. And that uh, you can find that by uh, unusual concentrations of cerebrospinal fluid. So I knew all about antibodies, and antibodies were really immunology, but T cells were just getting underway. I went to a lecture by a guy called Mel Greaves, who's a very prominent, uh, had a prominent career as a cancer immunologist, cancer biologist. And he was talking about T cells. And I thought, well, hell, I don't know anything about this, but I know there's a good group working on it at the ANU in Canberra. So I was supposed to come back and work for the CSIRO. And at senior level, I would have ended up at the big high security lab in Geelong. But um, I said to them, do you mind if I take a couple of years off if I can get some money and find out about T-cells, and then I'll apply this across into the veterinary systems. And, of course, that's where we made the big discovery that won the Nobel Prize, and I never got back to work in the veterinary world. So they did sort of adopt me again after the Nobel Prize because I'm the only (laughs) vet who's ever won a Nobel Prize. We're going to take a very short breather to come back to talk about that Nobel Prize, but I can tie those two disparate comments together, uh, Travis. 
about you, Peter, saying I had no real understanding of immunology and, and later the Nobel Prize. I think of the Dunning-Kruger effect, which does suggest that those who know very little think they know a lot about a topic, and those that know a lot about a topic understand how little they know and how much more there is to learn. Would you concur with that? Yes, of course. I comment regularly on climate change. <laughs> but, uh, and I'm told very frequently I know very little about it, but I do try and read into it. But it's, you know, the cause of climate change is in the physical sciences, and I'm not trained in that. But the, the consequences of climate change are in the biological sciences, so I, I feel perfectly capable of making comments on that. But I think the thing about a research thing is coming into a field where you're competent. I'd done my PhD and written a PhD thesis on the neuropathology story and the local antibody production and all that sort of story. But coming into a field where you, you're not really in it, you have a different type of expertise and a different type of, you know, different types of disciplines in science give you a different type of thinking. And I think that, um, as I've always questioned everything, coming into immunology at that stage, which was pretty confused, actually, mm -hmm. uh, with that, was a big plus, because I wasn't in any sense trapped by what anybody else was saying. Yeah. And there's another argument for diversity around the table. Let's yeah. take a short break and be back in a moment to continue the story. Let's return now. It's, well, delayed gratification is something I try to train my daughters to appreciate. And we've been waiting to talk about the Nobel Prize. Peter, you're the, the first and only veterinarian to win a Nobel Prize, which helps us understand how you can tell us how the immune system distinguishes virus infected cells from normal cells. You started hedging towards us just before the break, but how did this research come about? Really by chance, we were looking at the, uh, there was a new T-cell assay called the cytotoxic T-cell assay, which is relatively new, and, but it was used a lot for uh, in tra the transplant reaction. That was a classical use of it. If you exposed uh, cells in culture to tissue from another in individual or, or a, a non-transplant match mouse, uh, you get a very, very strong reaction and the killer T cells that you got out would kill, that, kill those cells or, or kill cells like them when you took them out of culture and exposed them. So that was a very strong phenomenon. The transplant system itself had been under study since the 1930s mm -hmm. when uh, people like George Snell uh, tried to uh, look at cancer immunity in mice and they were generating tumours in mice with methapalanthrine and then transferring them to other mouse. And they found they were very rapidly rejected. But he was a smart guy, and he quickly worked out it was nothing to do with the cancer. It was due to the fact of these transplant differences. So he set out to map it using classical genetics, just as uh, the sort of experiments that, that, uh, that have been done since 1900, uh, back crossing and, and inbreeding and line breeding to fix certain genetic traits and uh, then correlate that with graft rejection. So that actually mapped uh, the mouse major histocompatibility complex. It was more difficult in humans, but people like Jan Dassey, who shared the Nobel Prize with Snell, and Baruch Ben Asaraf and, um, and Jan van Rood in, in the Netherlands had been doing a lot to define human transplant systems because there was a lot of interest, of course, in human transplantation then was, was just getting underway. When we were in Edinburgh, there was quite a strong program uh, there, actually. And so people like Woodruff, Michael Woodruff was, was doing this stuff. And uh, so we were doing experiments with the virus infected mice and we were quite unknowingly, we were testing, we were immunizing the mice and we were getting these cy cytotoxic T cells out of the mice and then exposing them to virus infected cells in culture and showing they killed those cells without even really thinking about it. The mouse, the mice and the cells we were using as targets had the same transplantation type. And then someone came along, and in fact, it was actually Graham Mitchell from Victoria, a well-known parasitologist, also a vet by training, who trained at the Weehide, and then was at Stanford with Hugh McDevitt, who was a famous transplantation immunologist, came up with the idea there was some genetic effect on the level of response uh, in the, the T-cell compartment determined by the 
transplant system or the major histocompatibility complex. And so we actually did the experiment and we found that the killer T cells we were generating would not kill cells from a different mouse that had a different MHC type. So we actually real worked out that really what was happening is the antibody molecules are about grabbing hold, say, viral proteins. They recognize tertiary, folded tertiary structure of viral proteins. They grab hold of it. They block it from ideally from uh, interacting with the receptor on the cell surface because viruses have to get into cells. So classically, the anti-spike stops it binding to ACE2 in COVID. And so we realized that the T cells were doing something completely different because if they had to recognize we, we said they are we thought they might be recognizing a modified version of the transplant molecule. And we called it all for self. And nobody had ever suggested that, really. And then we, as we thought about it, we thought, well, this is a, you know, the killer T cell's job is to kill. Hmm. It can't kill a virus because it's tiny, but it can kill another cell. So if it has to recognize the transplant molecule and the transplant molecule is modified, that's what's focusing it onto the virus infected cell so it can kill it. And this was a chance discovery. We just happened to use MHC mismatch mouse. We found that they would they kill within the right system and they didn't kill across that system. It was very clean. Uh, we had a very clear assay. And then we worked that through and we mapped it to using some of the mice that people like Snell had developed where they'd isolated the various genetic uh, loci and then the genes at those loci and, and were able to show that this uh, was indeed the case. And we just suggested that. We took a hypothesis, suggested this is the basis of immunological surveillance. This is how surveillance works against viruses or cancer or anything else. Uh, that was totally revolutionary. And so <laughs> some people thought that was very interesting. A lot of people didn't understand it because they were used to thinking of T cells as recognizing something foreign rather than monitoring self. And others uh, thought we were nuts. So <laughs> we were. <laughs> Basically, some people thought we were interesting and ex doing exciting work. Other, others thought we were crooks, and uh, <laughs> we turned out to be right. <laughs> now, can I can I ask because you are challenging the status quo and the accepted immunology knowledge of the time? How were you convinced what you were saying was right? Did you have self doubt? Oh, sure. We argued two alternative ideas. One one was the idea that other people were out there, and then we tried to say, how does this fit with the results? Well, the other idea didn't fit with the results. It didn't make any sense. And, and the whole thing didn't make any sense. But most people were very wedded to that. Hmm. And uh, the, the, they, they thought there were two receptors, one for the MHC molecule, one for the virus protein. And so we thought, you know, we kept looking at it. We kept doing experiments. We did a lot of biological experiments. We showed that the inflammatory response obeyed the same principle and uh, so forth. And we just couldn't fake, make the other model fit. Uh, but we didn't have the tools at our disposal uh, to to solve it. And uh, basically it was because uh, it was very hard to look at small amounts of protein on cell service. The, they didn't have the uh, the technology then uh, to, to express genes and all that sort of thing. All that came along within the next 10 years and we were shown to be right. But other people did those experiments, but, you know, what we'd said was spot on. Did you so have any... that's how you win a Nobel Prize. I wrote a book about it. You know, <laughs> get a, right. get, get, make a big discovery, get something right about it early on, and then let other people do the work. <laughs> Was there any <laughs> setbacks? Did a lot of work too. I mean, yeah, yeah. Was there any setbacks that you had? Oh, you always have set works and setbacks in biomedical research. You think you sometimes you think you've you've hit gold again, and it turns out to be uh, to be copper. Basically, you know, you'll do an experiment that looks really good, and then you'll repeat the experiment and it looks good, really looks less good, so that the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow turns into a crock of something else. And so, basically, yeah, that's the experience of experimentalists. And if you're sort of probing the edges of a subject, uh, you'll get things wrong. I mean, you, you, at times you may overinterpret, you may, uh, you may put too much credence in a particular result. So, yes, you do get things wrong, but that's to be expected. And uh, the only safe way is not to do anything original. Just, just before we move on, those, those fundamental moments of conversation you had with your colleague where a different idea was posited, 
But if I was trying to shoot this in a movie, where were the, where did those conversations happen? What would the scene look like? Are they over a coffee table? Are they in the lab and questioning each other or in a myriad of places? Basically in the lab. And then the process was my colleague Rolf Zinkenagel is Swiss. I mean, he didn't, his English writing skills were, shall we say, not spectacular. Mm -hmm. He did tend to put the verb at the end of the sentence and all that sort of thing. Yeah. But so I was doing all the writing. And I'd learnt to write very economically in Edinburgh. I mean, you know, the Scots yes. in some quarters have a reputation for meanness. <laughs> they're not mean, they're pastimonious. They don't waste words. So where and so I could write an article and get all the information across in half the half the space that one of my American colleagues would use. I think uh, there's been a very big German influence in American academic life and um there was a tendency, especially back then, is is never use a hundred words when a thousand will suffice. Yes, <laughs> I think we're all familiar with that. We are. Yes. Yeah, and so I was doing all the writing, and basically, as McFarlane Burnett said, and this is certainly true for me, I only ever really think things through properly when I try to write it, and so that's why I always try to get young scientists to start writing fairly quickly and bring their data together, pull their data together and try and see what it means. And it's one of the hardest things to get young scientists to do or, or some young scientists to do because they love doing experiments. They love, they love pipetting and doing experiments. But, you know, I think it's a really good idea to actually think about what you've got. And so I was actually, I think we, we were sort of cross pollinating, if you like, and uh, his, he, he knew more formal immunology than I did. He did on a formal immunology course in Switzerland. He, he was a medical graduate, um, started out to do surgery. I don't know what happened, but he said both he and his mentor decided it would be better if he did something else. <laughs> so, uh, so he went into immunology. If I can insert a quick footnote for medical students listening in, given you are quite immersed in social media these days and you'd be familiar with blogging, young students who get a bee in their bonnet of something they're interested in, I'm guessing from what you're saying, you would encourage them to start exploring their ideas in blogging. I know it's different from specific medical I, writing, but it's sharpening the saw. Yes, it's, it depends how much effort you put into it, of course, because... You know, the job, of, as I always tell medical students or vet students or, or any professional students, your first job is to become a good professional. Right. I mean, you can hive off early if you want and decide you're going to be a scientist. But <laughs> if you're going, taking a medical training or a veterinary training, your first job and what you owe to society is to be a good, competent professional. And so I, I, I admire professionalism wherever, I, wherever you find it. I think that's one of the gems. And so, um, yes, I think uh, you can do some of that. And actually, I encourage all young scientists to do some, whether they make little YouTube videos of something they're doing that's interesting, or they, uh, they use Twitter, or they use other forms of social media. I'm on Twitter, uh, which is, you can get very, very good links of uh, information back from Twitter, or you could. I, I think it's gone downhill a lot since Musk uh, mm. sabotaged it. But um, but you would, particularly during COVID, you would get someone who say <laughs> reproductive obstetrician gynecologist by training, but reproduction, Im, Im, reproductive immunology, infectious disease, putting together very good uh, lists of symptoms and um, and references. Really, extremely helpful. Can I bring you to 1996, where you received the Nobel Prize? Can I ask what that experience was like? We knew we were kind of a bit in the frame uh, for the Nobel Prize because we'd been mentioned a number of times over the years, but I thought we missed out, actually, because there was a Nobel Prize in 1980 for the transplant system, and uh, we weren't anywhere in it. But then we started to hear some rumours, and then the year before we won the Alaska Basic Science Award, we shared it with three other guys, which is unusual, and we heard later because it was a, the last an American prize and Americans can never shut it up. So the committee leaked and we heard what <laughs> went on that the Harvard, there was a Harvard group of three who were eminently worthy scientists and uh, they'd been pushed by Harvard. But then one of the 
people on the committee, in fact, the senior immunologists on the committee said, well, you can't possibly consider them if you don't put these two guys in as well. So <laughs> we went in and then we got the Nobel Prize the next year and they didn't. And it must have caused a bit of anguish, I think. So we knew we, we were somewhere there, but I'd never thought much about the Nobel Prize or what it entailed or knew much about it. I hadn't been around a Nobel Prize winner at all. If you're at Harvard or, or Princeton or something, you know, you probably know Nobel Prize winners because there's plenty of them around. Hmm. So what happens with the medical Nobel Prize, it's always the first one announced in the first Monday in October. The actual award of the Nobel Prize is on 10th of December, which is the anniversary of Alfred Nobel's death. So we got a call at 4 a.m., I think it was, in the morning. Phone rang and we we're in Memphis and we had elderly relatives in Australia, so I assumed it might be a medical emergency or something like that. So I had no consciousness. This is what happened with the Nobel Prize. And, and a guy, my wife picked up the phone and uh, the, a guy said, this is uh, Niels Ringitz from the Nobel Foundation. And she said, this is for you. So, <laughs> um, so you know, he warned us that uh, our world would go mad in 10 minutes because they'd make the announcement and... Uh, so I called uh, our two sons and we called the publicity guy at St. Jude Hospital, which has a big fundraising aim and a big publicity operation. And, uh, and sure enough, within 10 minutes, we're getting calls from the Sydney Morning Herald and Talkback Radio and Bogota, Columbia and Reuters and what else. It was just crazy. So uh, the, what you're required to do is you're required to write a um, Nobel lecture and deliver that in Stockholm and go to Stockholm to collect the prize and... Um, and also a biography, which I was very frank because I thought it would be just buried in the book, but it actually <laughs> went up online straight away. So I've had it quoted back to me for the last 25 years. <laughs> and, and it was a big event in Stockholm. Uh, it's a whole week of celebrations. They prep you for it. Uh, the three formal dinners, white tie and tails and all the rest of it. So, so quite, a, quite a spectacular. First time I've ever had a an assigned car and driver. It was a stretch Volvo of all things. <laughs> of course. And, uh, Volvo. <laughs> and, uh, and a minder. We had a diplomat. The uh, junior diplomat was our minder. And we, uh, we've stayed in contact with her over the years. Did it change anything about, did it open up more doors? Or did the, the perspective on your experiments change at all? Well, it, it, time is everything, as we know. And uh, it takes time. Uh, so it, it, it's a transition, really, uh, because it takes a fair amount of your time. The, the lab went, ran well for another 10 years or so. I had very talented people in it. We were doing good stuff. It was very exciting. There was a technical breakthrough that allowed us to do a lot of the things we've been trying to do for years. So from 1996 till 2010, I suppose, uh, I was very involved. And then I started to back off because I was getting older and wanted to see younger people get the resources and all the rest of it. Yes, it, it, uh, it changed things. But what changed things a lot for me too, you normally have a very busy year after the Nobel. Everyone wants you. They don't want you because you're you. They want you because you're a Nobel <laughs> Prize winner and you're the latest one out of the box. So they want you for some Nobel lecture they've got set up in their schedule. And you fall for that for a while and then you realise, well, <laughs> how tedious this all is. But the other thing that happened is on Christmas Eve, I'm in Memphis, Tennessee, and I get a call almost Christmas Eve, saying I've been made the Australian of the Year for 1997. <laughs> it wasn't like the Australian of the Year is now where you sort of have a sort of Miss America contest between the states, but it was uh, just some people sat in a back room in Sydney with a couple of bottles of Grange and had to decide on someone so they could get on with the drinking. And uh, and if you won a Nobel Prize, you were it. So, so we came back to Australia three or four times through that year, and that's when I really got into the public communication stuff, because we spoke at all the capital cities and I did a lot of public lectures, which weren't something that was normally on my agenda. Mm. Can I ask then, if you're looking back at your career, is there, like with all the awards and publications research, what was probably the most enjoyable time that you had? Well, the most exciting time was definitely after we had that, we made that big discovery. I'd, I'd always worked hard and sometimes... You know, sometimes very hard. I mean, post morteming a sheep at 12 o'clock at night in the middle of a Scottish winter and taking its brain out isn't necessarily the greatest fun. But uh, <laughs> there are ups and downs in a scientific career where you, you, you find things and you discover some big things and one very big thing in our case, and you discover a lot of smaller things. But 
but you do make discoveries. And uh, so it's all very gratifying. I think uh, in the scientific sense, uh, I think uh, obviously the, the work that led to the Nobel was spectacularly exciting and we just worked. We only worked together for two and a half years, but we worked absolutely flat out. And it's, it's telling there are almost no family photographs from that time. Yeah. We both had small kids, but neither of us were taking any photographs and um, we're just so busy and fortunately our wives put up with us and uh, <laughs> and decided to keep us and um, <laughs> that was good. And then can I just ask, in your perspective of viral pathogenesis and immunology, do you think there's the right amount of funding in it? Is there many problems or is, is there, there's always times, always a problem? What's your perspective looking at that at the moment? Look, there's never enough funding and, and some things are very difficult. You know, COVID is, is an extremely complex pathogenesis, a horrible disease. You know, I worked for years. We, we worked on various infections, lymphocytic choriomeningitis, which is the Norena virus, flaviviruses, like the insect-borne ones, uh, herpes. We worked on a mouse, gamma herpes, which is so a bit like EBV or the Kaposi's virus. And so we worked on a number of different types of virus which have various complexities. I've, ne I've always tried to work with virologists rather than do the virology, which has been a big plus. But most of our work over the last 30 years has been with influenza. In my case, we were doing experiments in mice trying to look at the basic immunology. But over the last 15 years or so, my younger colleague, Catherine Kizieska at uh, Melbourne University and Paul Thomas, who followed me at St Jude Children's Research Hospital, have both got heavily into human influenza and human T-cell immunology and done a wonderful job. And the reason it's great is because the technology has now got to a point where you can do great things with human cells. Mm. You know, there was never a lot of human cellular immunology, say, done in the paediatric population or in the geriatric population, because particularly with the peds, you, the paediatricians don't want to take a lot of blood from a baby or a little kid unless they have to. And so now, though, we can do a hell of a lot with just a few cells because we can probe the molecular uh, profiles of individual cells and do extraordinary things with PCR and cell sorting and all that sort of stuff and look at um, epigenetic control and so forth. So human T-cell immunology, or human cellular immunology, has really had an enormous boost from COVID because it just happened by the time that COVID hit, we really started to get the, uh, the analyses in place and the technology in place. And so Catherine's lab in Melbourne and, and Paul in, in uh, St Jude have done really great experiments. There's an enormous amount to do there, but it's a matter of finding the funding to see these things through, but it's expensive research. We've had wonderful interactions with our clinician colleagues and uh, they're very much on board and very interested in trying to pull these things apart. We are just going to take one last break before we come back and I want this last break to prove to you, Peter, that you're not here because of the Nobel Prize. You're here because <laughs> of your pedigree in research. Back in a moment. I start, Peter, let's put my medical student cap on, my trying to read immunology, looking at alphabet number, numeric soup, effectively, <laughs> these days, and the whilst we appreciate the contribution you have made, there has been headaches, confusion, and crying when I've been trying to study immunology. Is there any easy way to study immunology these way, these days? I think you just need to get some general principles, personally. I think it's, there's an awful terminology. I mean, it, because it's complicated and there's all sorts of mo molecules involved, but... But basically, I mean, the, the T cell, the killer T cell thing is basically about immune surveillance. It's looking at cell surface, it's finding out what's wrong, and it's uh, knocking off the cells. And, and you know, they could, those cells can go to sleep in cancers. And uh, Jim Allison and, uh, really worked out how to wake them up with a monoclonal antibody, which would turn off the off switch and yeah. stuff so principles like that and then and then the cytokine production chemokine production mm -hmm. enormously complex yeah. uh has all sorts of uh, pleiotropic effects and you know basically once stuff gets into the blood and it's a chemical it gets to the brain yeah 
And, uh, you know, you have all these central effects. You also have effects working through the sympathetic nervous system. And so uh, the immunology is the most complex and difficult to study of all the areas because mm. even the brain, the brain at least is hardwired. You know, you know it's got a central processing unit, the brain. The yeah. immune system doesn't have a central processing unit. Mm. It's, uh, it, it's a loose concatenation mm. of various types of cells interacting transiently with other, producing secreted molecules that have have sort of effects on other cells and then uh, then the the cells are dispersed around the body. We never even know how big it is because we don't know how many cells are out of the tissues and the blood. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's an area of great confusion. It's a perfect subject for me because uh, <laughs> I like to speculate about things, but... But it is a very, very complex well, system. The and amazing, so the I, amazing. I think just keeping yeah. those the broad principles in mind. If you get bogged down in the detail, nobody remembers it anyway. I mean, there's all these interleukins and cytokines and uh, and, mm. and all the rest of it. I can't remember all that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Well, the amazing thing is the contribution the immune system's now doing for uh, cancer therapy, which is uh, yeah, just yeah. just incredible that we've gotten just a remarkable well, the effect. Well, antibodies, uh, the anti-PD one and so forth, has been an extraordinary breakthrough. And Jim and uh, and uh, uh, Honjo both got uh, shared a Nobel Prize for that, and them very well merited. And then, of course, uh, monoclonal antibodies against particular molecules too that. Uh, that uh, can hold cancers in check and all the rest of it. And that's a great, they're great therapies. Unfortunately, they're very expensive therapies. And that, that's a real problem. Mm -hmm. And they're not without side effects. One of the things about medicine is, is the way it gets translated to the broader community. You sort of get the impression, maybe from the TV, that someone has a heart transplant one week and they're out surfing the next. I mean, there's a little bit more complicated than that, as we know. And, you know, the fact that you, you just don't lightly have a transplant. You've got to be on <laughs> immunosuppressive drugs for the rest of your life. But that doesn't sort of get across to people. We, we, um, maybe it's the interaction between the profession and, and the media, but, you know, the, the sort of overly optimistic view uh, can, uh, can fade at times. Yeah. Can mm. I ask, you're just moving away, just away from the hardcore science area, you dedicated quite a bit of time to publications, clearly at a broader audience than just scientists and doctors. And you did a publication called Setting It Straight, which had a particular focus on COVID. Can yeah. I ask, what drew you into this area of a broader communication of, of science and medicine? Well, I, I think it's, you know, public science education is, is a really difficult area. And we need to be, we need the public to be aware of certain things, and even the simplest things at times don't get across. For instance, the fact that no medical procedure operates without a risk benefit equation. You know, there's a risk in everything. I mean, it may be a minimal risk, but there's a risk. And so, you know, the way I approach everything, and anyone who's trained like me does, is with a risk benefit analysis. And, and I, I guess you do as, as clinicians as well. And so, and then there's probability, relative risk and so forth that, that uh, people don't think in terms of. So we get all this stuff. I mean, 60 Minutes will run this program about, uh, about the terrible medical regulators who won't allow this marvellous new drug that's been discovered by some guy and you get it from... Um, <laughs> some sort of weed or something, and it will cure cancer, but they won't approve it for a little Jimmy or something. Then, of course, you know, so the, 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 the guys in the regulatory agencies are all, uh, all monsters. And then, and then, of course, if they did approve it and it kills little Johnny, when they're all monsters for approving this drug, <laughs> why did that happen? So you can't win, basically, against, uh, against the creepier elements of the media. And, you know, we're also faced with this enormous uh, disinformation industry and God knows how artificial intelligence is going to impact that. So somehow or other we've got to try and cut through and get people to start thinking clearly for themselves about these things. <laughs> it's difficult. I mean, I watched a program on the television last night of people voluntarily being injected under the skin and the face with all sorts of crap so they'll look a bit better. Where do they think this stuff goes? What do they think it's doing? Mm -hmm. I, I got into terrible trouble on Twitter because I pointed out that if you're tattooed with blue dye, your lymph nodes will likely turn blue as well. 
Oh wow! Because it follows exactly the same path as the uh, as the vaccine to your lymph nodes, and it will sit there in macrophages for the rest of your life. Yeah. Can I ask then, <laughs> with with your perspective and and probably a unique perspective, where do you think the next advances in science will actually come from? Yeah, I mean, you, you can never really predict, but it's all coming from from complex technology and from analytical systems. Uh, and we need, we have to, you know, we don't do experiments now. As, as an immunologist, if you, once you get into that complexity you mentioned before, uh, you can measure enormous numbers of parameters for an experiment, but you actually need this whole informatics uh, structure to to try and make linkages and so forth. So we've got an enormous capacity to make linkages, but it, it often doesn't help us all that much. And still, you know, it's the it's the that old immunosuppressive drug that made a big difference in COVID, and, uh, yeah, you know, and and was great. And so uh, it's still a lot of try and see what happens mm, stuff. Yeah, with people thinking rationally. I mean, you know, thinking. But but you know, we I think we bought anti interleukin six and anti interleukin one. I think uh, a number of these anti. GMCSF were all tried in that latter stage of the severe COVID disease. I don't think they worked any better than the uh, than the immunosuppressive pharmaceutical mm -hmm. agents. So, yeah. but I think we will find more molecules that are targets for various types of therapy, whether it be immunotherapy or other therapy. And if uh, if we had infinite money, we could go after a lot of these molecular pathways more. But the problem is, I think part of the problem is that the the actual development of drugs, even though you may make discoveries in the lab, is still up to the pharmaceutical industry. And that's still an industry that's basically interested in making money. And so basically we need other ways to develop some types of therapeutics. And we, we've always known about that for, um, say, paediatric cancer. I mean, you, you just don't have the numbers of cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, also if you're thinking about antiviral drugs, Basically, we're going to have to, I think we should be making family-specific drugs, you know, anti-coronavirus, anti-paraflu and all that sort of thing against all these families of drugs that are potential pandemic threats. And there's a big push to do that. But you can't expect the pharmaceutical industry to put a lot of money into it because there's no real profit into it until something happens. Mm. So we've got to do it outside that, uh, that kind of structure. Can I ask then, in reflection of your career, is there anything you know now that you wish you had known earlier? Well, well, lots of things, of course. And, <laughs> and you know, you think about that, you think the path's not taken and where it might have led. But, but of course, you can never explore it. So you just got to go with, the, go with the, what happened. <laughs> and you, you, I realise you, you realise you've made mistakes and, you know, I made one disastrous move that cost me quite a bit in terms of... Um, research productivity and so forth, and uh, it took me five years to get out of it. So I don't, I, you don't want to go into them. I mean, should I have trained in medicine initially? You would think so. But, but of course, if I had trained in medicine, I think probably as someone coming from, from a poorer family, and uh, uh, I would probably have settled for what I think is a great role in society, the role of the good doctor. <laughs> And that, that's, I've seen my colleagues, uh, I always a little bit envious of some of my clinical research colleagues in the sense that science is very focused and targeted and obsessive, but the clinic is different because you're dealing with all sorts of things and, and it's a different type of activity. It's almost, I think, a relaxation at times for these guys. <laughs> but on the other hand, if I had been medically qualified and I'd gone into this the problem there is you can easily become involved in um, in a lot of stuff like uh, running a path lab or mm. heavy duty heavy, heavy medical duties that you feel obligated to to follow, but will not necessarily make it so easy to be an effective researcher. It's a tough road, the physician investigator, and I have great admiration for those who do it well. Mm. That's why Dr. Travis Brown is a general pathologist and a podcaster. <laughs> well, that's a very valuable contribution. <laughs> well, that's a final question now. Peter, do you have any final advice for doctors, medical students, even scientists that you'd like to leave with our audience? It's hard to know. I think, I think um, well, be a good professional, I think, is, is and have that at the forefront of your thinking. 
But the professionalism, what is it? I'm a professional scientist. And so my professionalism is, is different in detail from your professionalism. I think, uh, on, on, honestly, a lot of the lessons that maybe the medical profession needed to learn a bit better have been learnt. I mean, uh, in, particularly in interacting with patients, I mean, there's a totally different environment there, totally different way of doing it. Uh, n not so much separation, but collaboration. And if I look at my uh, general GP office, I mean, there are all sorts of allied health professionals involved, and that seems to be a way forward for the future. So I think the way forward is uh, that they can be quite clear. Um, the problem is actually paying for it all, though, because there's an infinite medical need, just as an infinite need for social services. And, and where do you draw the line so that other things can happen in society? Wow. All right. On that beautiful note, and just a hat tip for any larrikins from Queensland, uh, if you know someone in the research field, call them at four o'clock in the morning <laughs> with an accent and say they've won a Nobel Prize. <laughs> well, if it hadn't been for the accent, and uh, I would have thought it was someone from the lab <laughs> evacuating a hoax. And I'd always thought that was a possibility because I had some absolute scoundrels in the lab at the time. <laughs> Professor Peter Doherty, thank you so much for joining This Medical Life. Yeah, you're welcome. Nice to talk. This Medical Life is recorded in the Talked About Marketing Studios in Adelaide. For show notes and more information about the podcast, visit thismedicallife.com.au. You can contact the hosts via Twitter, Dr. Travis Brown is at Dr. Travis Brown. That's DR for doctor. And Steve Davis is at Steve Davis. Editing and production is by Tim Whiffen. Design is by Tom Buzzenjut. This has been a Pathnotes Proprietary Limited production. Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you.